Uh, we're going to sort of go through, we're going to have Bruce come up here in a little while, do his talking, and then afterwards we'll have respondents um, from first. We'll have Samantha Brotman, who is a visiting lecturer and Arabic specialist at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, in the Intensive English Institute and as a special projects coordinator with the Arab Studies Institute. After Samantha, we'll be hearing from Jody Bird, who is a citizen of the Chalkasaw Nation of Oklahoma and an associate professor of American Indian Studies and English at UIUC, and the author of The Transit of Empire. It's funny, the lights keep changing, so like I have to adjust my eyes. That's okay. <laughs> it's, 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 it's fun. Um, <laughs> uh, Jody is the author of Transit of Empire, Indigenous Critiques of Colonialism. Uh, out on Minnesota Press. It's a fa fantastic book. You should all pick it up. Then we will hear from Bruce Levine, who is the J James Randall Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Illinois as well, and the author of a number of books, most recently the epic The Fall of the House of Dixie, The Civil War and the Social Revolution that Transformed the South, out from Random House on, uh, in 2013. Now, as many of you know, um, this is the second of our canceled events um, in the crisis that followed the Salada scandal, uh, what we've now dubbed it. Um, and this, as a, a canceled event, we've taken this opportunity to not only reconstruct how we are uh, thinking about our own university, um, whether it be our collective response, our actions, our politics, but also the, the ways that we can uh, avoid the university and use other spaces to rethink how we can come together in this moment of crisis. So this second of uh, following the Catherine uh, uh, Frankie event, this event offers us another opportunity to rethink um, some of the things happening on campus. Um, so we've been uh, uh, graced with the presence of Bruce Robbins, who is the Old Dominion Foundation Professor in the Humanities at the Department of English and Comparative Lit Literature at Columbia University, who has authored also a number of many books, uh, most recently Perpetual War, Cosmopolitanism from the Viewpoint of Violence, um, and for those of you who weren't aware, Bruce was one of the first people, uh, first scholars to cancel his talk or cancel his event at the University of Illinois. And he did this before the, the actual boycott was announced. And in many ways, this act of, of dissent was an opportunity to start a conversation. And his presence here is a continuation of this conversation. And I, for those of you who didn't read his original letter, and with his permission, I will read it. I have your permission, correct? Yes, OK. I didn't actually have the opportunity to ask you before. But I wanted to read it because uh, you know when it originally came out, it, it was a uh, it was a, a very emotional moment, and I actually, with all the things that have happened in the last few months, I'd forgotten how early on he wrote this. Um, and, and it came out August 7th, right? August 7th, remember. Um, we had just heard, it was just the week after we had all just heard. So I want to read it. It, it was, it came out on his, you, you posted it first on Facebook, correct? Yeah, okay. So, and it was titled, Why This Jewish American Can't Visit Urbana-Champaign. Addressed to Professors Lauren Goodlad, one of the organizers of this event, Michael Rothberg, and Mati Bunzel. Dear Lauren, Michael, and Mati, grateful as I am for your invitation to screen my film, some of my best friends are Zionists on the Urbana-Champaign campus in October, I am afraid I will have to decline. I am enormously appreciative of all of you all for your scholarship and your solidarity with the project of others. Thanks to you, Lauren and Michael, I spent a very exciting and rewarding two weeks in Urbana-Champaign as Mellon professor and have benefited from your hospitality on more occasions than I can count. 
Nevertheless, the decision that Chancellor Phyllis Weiss and the University of Illinois administration reached to fire Professor Stephen Saleda for his political views makes it impossible for me to have anything more to do with that campus, at least until this decision is reversed and Professor Saleda is reinstated. I hope that will happen before October. I will not rehearse for you the reasons why this firing is an outrage to anyone who cares about academic freedom or see simple human decency. I'm sure you will already see them very clearly for yourselves. Professor Soleda spoke up privately in his capacity as a citizen against what history will surely agree, everyone outside the United States already does, was a massacre of the innocents in, Ga in Gaza. In punishing him for speaking up by taking away his job, Chancellor Wise has inscribed her name in a shameful list that includes Joseph McCarthy, among others. I'm confident that history will deal with Chancellor Wise much as it has dealt with McCarthy. But she will not have to be, wait to be judged by history. Thanks to her, the Urbana-Champaign campus is going to become a no man's land, famous for embarrassing itself in public. I'm sure I am not the only academic who will no longer want to be associated with it in any way. With regret, and again, much gratitude, gratitude to you as individuals, Bruce. <laughs> so before Bruce comes up here, I wanted to read to you very quickly, as quickly as I can, a partial list of the names that are boycotting our university in an act of solidarity to think through again, and I'm just gonna read their names, not their affiliations or who they were coming to speak to. I'm gonna start with the conferences. The Education Justice Project, the entire conference was canceled. Todd Clear, Devon Pena, Kyla Wazana Tompkins, Robert Ku, Mel Chen, Roderick Ferguson, Karma Chavez, Lisa Hall, Miriam Sweeney, Catherine Frankie, Jeff McMahon, Matthew Himley, Julie Green, Amy Chuskull, uh, I can't read my own handwriting, Leora Oslander, John Demos, Jonathan Kmanvig, David Ebry, Rafaela De Rosa, Eric Schwitzgobel, Mark Van Rugen, Jonathan Judikin, Spence Wilson, oh, that he's Spence Wilson, Yuad de Capua, Alan Mitchell, <coughs> Nicholas Lampert, Alan Isaacman, David Blacker, Rachel Cowgill, Jeffrey Sammons, Tanar Akram, Sarah Castile, Laura Rausch, Alice Pauli. And now we have Bruce Robbins. How did you do that? Okay, that's how you do it. Um, it was actually very hard to decline the invitation to come here because I've had some of my most exciting intellectual experiences on this campus. And my gratitude to uh, Lauren Goodlad and Michael Rothberg actually goes way beyond anything that I expressed in that very, very angry email. Um, and then Facebook posting. Um, and I guess I needed to say that. But uh, it's also a little bit unfortunate to hear that email read out now, because it's pretty much all I'm going to say again. But look, you're, if you are so uh, kind as to come to this, then you're probably prepared to hear again things that you have already heard. and. Uh, know very well. Those of you who are curious enough to see my film just now will remember the Pittsburgh 11th grader, Jesse Lieberfeld. Jesse won the Martin Luther King Jr. Essay Prize, which asked high school kids in Pittsburgh to write about what Martin Luther King's ideas meant to them personally. <clears throat> As a Jewish American, Jesse wrote in his essay, he felt that King's call for equal rights for everyone was most relevant to the situation of the Palestinians. 
who are kept from statehood and from equal rights, both by Israel and by Israel's supporters in America, especially Jewish Americans like himself. Israel, right or wrong, is like white supremacy. In closing ranks against all critics of Israel and thus supporting Israel's systemic mistreatment of the Palestinians, his fellow American Jews were affirming solidarity with their own race at the expense of another race, Jesse wrote. They were playing the role of the segregationist South. There was footage that Jesse's father, whom you also see in the film, didn't give me permission to use, finally, in which he and his wife reported on their conversations with officials at Jesse's high school. Um, as the film says, at the ceremony for prize winners at the end of the year when other students read their essays, the school officials hadn't allowed Jesse to read his essay. They decided that the essay was too controversial, this is in the film, and the parents seemed to have felt that though they were proud of their son, the outcry against Jesse being what it was, and it was quite a shitstorm, uh, they had better go along with that decision. In retrospect, it seems to me they weren't proud of themselves, which is why they wouldn't let me use the footage. The word Zionism that I put in my title doesn't refer to the belief that Israel has a right to exist. That's something I believe myself, subject, of course, to further discussion about things like equal rights for all. When I use the word Zionism, I'm referring to people who deduce from their belief in Israel's right to exist that critics of Israel's actions are anti-Semites, even if all they demand is equal rights before the law. People who believe that an 11th grader who makes an analogy between the attitude of his fellow American Jews toward the Palestinians and the attitude of white segregationists to African Americans should not be allowed to express his ideas at a school assembly. I look forward to the day in the not very distant future when Zionism in this sense, like racial segregation, will be an ideology that any self-respecting person would be embarrassed to advance in public or even to feel in private. The analogy is also meant to serve as a reminder that though this would be a big change, big changes do happen. In many circles, racial segregation was considered a respectable position. I said this in the film not too long ago. Back then, those who spoke up against it got the sort of treatment that Stephen Salida has gotten here. It sometimes seems miraculous to me that so much has changed within my lifetime, if only in official discourse, and in spite of the persistence of racism, not only in official discourse, not only in the celebrating of Martin Luther King Day or the giving out of essay prizes honoring Martin Luther King's thought. There are, I think, historical grounds for believing that soon enough, the chancellor and the trustees and the donors who conspired to deprive Stephen Salida of his employment will themselves feel embarrassed at what they have said and done. I'm not going to talk about the particulars of the Stephen Salida case, which I'm sure you all know more about than I do. Um, it's also embarrassing to me even to mention, let alone to have to refute arguments uh, against Stephen Salida that seem to me unworthy of representatives of such an excellent university. So I kind of switched focus to what I called a new McCarthyism, which is a slightly different topic. The word McCarthyism conjures up blacklists, witch hunts, congregational committees, congressional committees, and so on. Is this term overreaching? It may be. McCarthyism was a phenomenon of the Cold War. It targeted communism. Criticism of Israel for its occupation, for its ongoing theft of Palestinian land, for its bombing of civilians in Gaza, is not really analogous to support for communism. Most of the people targeted under, McCarthy, under McCarthyism were not communists, and most of those targeted as critics of Israel really are critics of Israel. What we're not is anti-Semites. More on that in a minute. The idea of a new McCarthyism is also imprecise 
in the sense that pressure on universities coming from wealthy, powerful, and usually conservative elements in society goes back much farther than Senator Joseph McCarthy's Red Scare campaign of the 1950s. It goes back at least as far as the period of America's entry into World War I. At Columbia, President Nicholas Murray Butler gave an address in 1917 warning of serious trouble for anyone on the faculty who did not wholeheartedly support the war effort. And I remind you that Woodrow Wilson had campaigned to keep America out of the war. And then suddenly the powers that be were coming down hard on that once respectable position. Columbia's president was as good as his word. The two most outspoken opponents of the war on the Columbia faculty were fired. John Dewey, who taught at Columbia, many of you will know, like certain other supposed defenders of academic freedom who might come to mind, found himself in a difficult position, torn between his pioneering work to define and defend the still new and fragile concept of academic freedom on the one hand, and on the other, his enthusiasm for, for the war, which Dewey, Dewey later came to regret. Dewey did the right thing. He objected strenuously to the dismissals of his fellow faculty members. Unlike certain other defenders of academic freedom who might come to mind, he found he could not in good conscience forsake the principle of academic freedom to which he had devoted so much of his energy. For many historians, and I feel a little uneasy speaking in the presence of real historians, World War I, whose centenary we are celebrating this year, has come to seem a stupendous waste of human life, resulting from a conflict in which there was, a morally, there was, morally speaking, little or nothing to choose between the two sides. As everyone knows, World War I also carries the moral burden of having helped produce World War II, which has even more impressive numbers. Up until very shortly before the outbreak of hostilities in 1914, exactly 100 years ago, the labor parties in both Germany and France were firmly committed to the idea that they had no quarrel whatsoever with the ordinary Frenchmen and Germans across the border. Their last minute caving in to patriotism, which is to say caving in to patriotic hysteria, led to millions of meaningless deaths among their members and is arguably one of the greatest tragedies in history. It could have been avoided. The faculty members who were at Columbia, who were fired from Columbia, were trying to avoid it. At universities, we have the responsibility to remember moments like this and to apply them to the present. If necessary, fending off the patriotic hysteria of the present in order to do so. So we're kind of in the business of taking the long view. The long view is not infallible, but there are times when it helps. History has made a very severe judgment on Joseph McCarthy, on the lives he destroyed, and the lameness of the excuses that led him to destroy them, excuses that were fully accepted at the time by people who either believed them or were scared into going along. My title was intended to suggest that however widespread and pious the Zionist hysteria now seems, history will judge it in much the same way as it has judged McCarthyism, and those who went along with it as well. So is there really a new McCarthyism? That there are blacklists and witch hunts going on now, no one can doubt, who has looked into organizations like Campus Watch, which does list making, or Israel on Campus, which is active here from what I'm told. Some of you will have heard from my colleague, Catherine Frankie, how she was told by the Dean's Office at Columbia Law School that she could not announce a talk with the word Palestine in the title. Many of you will have heard of the case of Norman Finkelstein at DePaul, denied tenure after writing five books because Alan Dershowitz of the Harvard Law School led a campaign against him, and he too was judged to be uncivil, lacking in collegiality. Many of you will perhaps have heard of the Episcopal chaplain at Yale, Bruce Shipman, who last month responded to a New York Times op-ed 
by Holocaust scholar Deborah Lipstadt, and two weeks later was forced to resign. What did he say? This is what he said. Deborah E. Lipstadt makes far too little of the relationship between Israel's policies in the West Bank and Gaza and growing anti-Semitism in Europe and beyond. The trend to which she alludes parallels the carnage in Gaza over the last five years, not to mention the perpetually stalled peace talks and the continuing occupation of the West Bank. As hope for a two-state solution fades and Palestinian casualties continue to mount, the best antidote to anti-Semitism would be for Israel's patrons abroad to press the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for final status resolution to the Palestinian question. That's the end of the quote. Shipman lost his job over these sentences. And probably almost as bad, he was labeled an anti-Semite. Uh, anti and this because he said what seems to non-Zionist Jews like myself to be the merest common sense. Of course, anti-Semitism exists. It's why my father and his brother changed their names from Rabinowitz to Robbins. But there are, are also factors creating a new anti-Semitism. And the largest single factor adding to anti-Semitism is probably, as Shipman said, the conduct of the state of Israel and its military. To say this is in no way to condone anti-Semitism, as the people who got Shipman fired declare. Since when do you have to declare something unexplainable in order to avoid being accused of condoning it? Consider the logic. Like all human phenomena, the old, already existing anti-Semitism had its causes. For example, the Christian teaching that the Jews killed Christ. 2,000 years of that might be imagined to have a certain effect. What if some influential voices along the way had said to the priests, could you maybe cool it a little with that Christ killer stuff? These people might have dampened the production of anti-Semitism. According to the people who attacked the Yale chaplain, Bruce Shipman, they would have to be called anti-Semites. If anyone should be fired here, it should have been the people who attacked the Yale chaplain, first of all, because they're professionally incompetent, unable to think clearly, and second, because they were adding to the total quantity of anti-Semitism in the world by suggesting that to be Jewish is to support the killing of Palestinian children. But firing people you disagree with is a bad habit to get into. I note in passing that what Shipman said was more or less what Stephen Salida said in his now infamous tweet about Zionism making anti-Semitism appear honorable, whereas, of course, it is not honorable at all. Both men were expressing in necessarily abbreviated form, in the case of Twitter, very abbreviated, something that when spelled out makes perfect sense. Here is Stephen Salida from Israel's Dead Soul, his book, on the consequences of confusing Israel with Jewishness. It is never a good idea, even though the trope of, even through the trope of street, It's never a good idea to link an ethnic group to a military apparatus. Such a move automatically justifies discourses, in this case, anti-Semitic ones, that should never be justifiable. Since their critics seem so very sure of themselves, let me run through the problem in their logic again. I think this may be the first time in my life I'm actually speaking about anti-Semitism it's a very odd feeling, but I'm kind of grateful to you for bringing it out. The Zionists who got Shipman and Salida fired, you have to be very sure of yourself to try to do that, are asserting that anyone who thinks anti-Semitism might be reduced by changing Israeli policy is actually condoning anti-Semitism. More generally, to say that the existing quantity of anti-Semitism or any other form of racism might ever be decreased 
by doing X or Y would actually and necessarily be an expression of racism. So if you don't want to be accused of racism, you would have to say, in effect, that the existing quantity of anti-Semitism cannot be decreased in any way. It's not enough to say that anti-Semitism has been real and remains real and deplorable. You also have to say, in effect, that it's infinite and irreducible. This is empirically wrong and demonstrably so, but it does make a certain psychological sense if you look at it from the Zionist point of view. Psychologically, it enables the Zionist not only to feel like a victim, but to feel firmly anchored now and forever in the status of victim. The Zionists cannot admit that anything could be done to reduce the total amount of anti-Semitism in the world, because if the total amount of anti-Semitism in the world could be reduced, they could no longer feel totally secure in their victimhood, sure that they are victims and run no risk of ever becoming any less victims. This is why they are such sticklers on this point. The identity they have chosen for themselves depends on it, an identity which is not Judaism. What they appear unwilling to live without is a lifetime guarantee that they are and will always be victims, that victimhood is not merely a historical fact, which of course it is, but a now and forever identity that by definition cannot become any less peremptory and absolute, as it arguably has become for Jews in the United States, where, perhaps for that reason, the Zionist hysteria and the taboos on free speech are worst certainly worse than in Israel itself. What the Zionists want is an unassailable claim to the high moral ground, a claim in perpetuity. That, of course, will permit them to do to the Palestinians whatever they please, whenever they please, for as long as they please. Much the same logic has recently been on display at Fordham University in New York. At Fordham, incivility was again in question. This time, it was an Israeli historian who was accused of it. I don't imagine people have heard much about this story. It seems like a New York story so far. He was accused of incivility for repeatedly, repeatedly harassing his colleagues over the boycott, divestment, and sanctions resolution by the American Studies Association, which he strongly opposed. He demanded that the Fordham American Studies program withdraw from the American Studies Association, the national one, over this issue. And he threatened people if they didn't go along. Unlike Stephen Salida, he was bothering his colleagues by actual harassment and intimidation. It's not like the students who signed a petition here against Stephen Salida, who were presumably bothered merely by knowing Stephen Salida's opinions. But what is loveliest to me in the Fordham story is that the Israeli professor, although he was quickly exonerated of charges of incivility, found a way of continuing to consider himself a victim. He decided that his colleagues didn't have to say anything at all in order to show themselves to be Jew haters, that's his expression. They were Jew haters, and therefore he was suffering from their Jew hate merely because they did not actively support his proposal that Fordham's program resign from the National American Studies Association. Being accused of anti-Semitism has been a bit uncomfortable for the head of American Studies at Fordham, who has expressed no opinion at all on BDS, but has refused to resign from the organization, and who, thanks to the accusation, has been receiving daily floods of hate mail, including threats to her person and her family. For her accuser, it is an ingenious, almost foolproof way of ensuring that he can continue to claim the highly desirable status of victim of anti-Semitism while someone else is actually being victimized. Clearly, he's not the only one who's figured this trick out. It's the unofficial psychology of the new McCarthyism. It may be of only historical interest to notice that the Israel lobby has been borrowing freely from the language of multiculturalism. 
protection from discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and so on. Their appeal to students is based on the premise that allowing critics of Israel or supporters of the Palestinians to speak at all is the equivalent of racial discrimination. And why? Because it makes some students uncomfortable, especially students raised on an absolutely dogmatic Zionism who have never encountered any other opinions. The standard of comfort and the sense of entitlement it assumes bear some thinking about. It is, of course, antithetical to education itself, which often demands an experience of discomfort. It is not the standard in Israel, where these matters are debated very actively. It seems possible that it is unique to the United States. If so, it's not something to be proud of or for any administrator to be allowed to parrot without getting in some trouble for it, without being made to feel very uncomfortable. It's quite possible that I should tell the, the, not tell the following anecdote, but I seem to be on a roll, and um, it may be hard to stop me. <laughs> so I have discomfort on my mind because of an experience I myself had years ago at Rutgers, where I used to teach. At one point, I was turned down for a promotion. And in order to inquire into what had happened, I had someone arrange a lunch with one of the two people in my department who, according to an eyewitness, had voted against me on political grounds. This was not tenure. It was for some higher thing. So two votes would have been significant. He told me it was widely known, this is at lunch, face to face, that I failed students who did not share my views on Israel. I said this was unlikely because, A, I didn't teach the Middle East and therefore didn't know anyone else's views on the Middle East. And B, up to that point, I didn't believe I had failed any student at any time in any class. <laughs> I wheedled a little bit, and finally the truth came out. Precisely one Israeli student had come to him, and this one student had said that I made him uncomfortable. Uncomfortable not because I had said or done anything in the classroom, but merely because he knew what my views on the Middle East were. At the time, this left me speechless, both about the student and even more so about my colleague. But maybe the real point is that my colleague would not have behaved as he did, spreading and acting on what he knew to be falsehoods, if he did not feel behind him the weight of an immense self-righteous consensus a consensus that the facts didn't matter because what I stood for was evil. The facts and respect for the facts were an important subject a few years back at Columbia. I'm still on this new McCarthyism thing. When we had our run in, some of you will know about it, with the so-called David Project. The David Project financed a film called Columbia Unbecoming in which students went on camera to complain about Columbia faculty in Middle East studies, this is not including me, who had supposedly humiliated and intimidated them and mistreated them in various ways. The David Project took the film around to administrators and then to journalists and tried quite successfully to raise a stink. Then Congressman Anthony Weiner, some of you will recognize that name, because he later got caught raising quite a stink of his own over sex photos of himself that he sent to various female constituents, he demanded that my colleague Rashid Khalidi be fired. Khalidi was not fired by Columbia, but he was dehired from a position consulting the New York City school system about the Middle East, and without protest from the president of Columbia. The public pressure was so great that Columbia was obliged to appoint a committee to investigate the charges, which they did. After taking many depositions, the committee found that almost all of the charges were completely baseless. One complaint turned out to center on an exchange that had happened off campus. Only one charge was found to be credible, and that charge about the answer to a question concerned a faculty member with whom only one complaining student 
had actually taken a course. That student had received a grade in that course of A minus. So it had all been about nothing, nothing but some very entitled students who felt a certain discomfort and some very rich backers who got those students' voices heard. But it was a huge PR success for the David Project, which had all the newspapers in New York buzzing about the supposed affair for months. And it was a shot across the bow for Israel's critics everywhere, especially those not protected by tenure. And of course, one way of describing the scandal here is to measuring it is the amount of self-censorship uh, all around the United States that is going to result from one case like Stephen Salaitis. Ellen Schrecker, who has written the definitive history of McCarthyism in the university, remarks on McCarthyism's relative mildness. McCarthyism, she says, was consensual and nonviolent. It ended up killing only two people. About 100 people lost their jobs, and several hundred went to jail. I assume that some of those who went to jail didn't lose their jobs or didn't have any. Have any. McCarthyism was not Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russia. Still, it's worth remembering one or two of the stories. The University of Minnesota banned a concert by Paul Robeson on the grounds that a concert would require a rebuttal of his, quote, one-sided and musically overtoned propaganda. <laughs> the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois, I don't know if you all know this, uh, can be proud of the story of musicologist Norman Kasdan who was denounced as a communist, which he was, and fired, then subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Then, as now, no one had to prove that he failed in any way in the performance of his professional duties. And no one can prove that the denunciation, firing, and subpoena led to his divorce. He landed on his feet. He got a job. His life didn't end. The example that haunts me personally is that of the brilliant Harvard critic of American literature, F.O. Matheson, who was a Christian, a socialist, never a member of the Communist Party, and a closeted gay man who was under investigation by McCarthy's House on American Activities Committee in early 1950 when he threw himself out of a 12th story window. No one can prove that McCarthy was going to expose Matheson's sexuality, or that the investigation was the direct cause of his suicide. But it would be strange if history were to let McCarthyism off the hook, because not all the destruction that followed in its wake can be proved. And history has not let them off the hook, nor, I think, will it spare the new blacklisters and witch hunters today. The principle that's supposed to protect universities from McCarthyism is, of course, academic freedom. In the case of McCarthyism, it failed. In general, as Schrecker writes, the universities caved. In the case of Stephen Salida, it has failed thus far, but the story is not over. The principle has been violated. Those who violated it will either find some clever way to change their minds, or their names will live uncomfortably in infamy. But the moral for us may be that the principle of academic freedom is not enough that this is a fight that also has to be carried outside the university and conducted along other lines of attack. For example, as concerns the power of money to interfere where it ought not to interfere. I hope a legal case will be filed against the University of Illinois that will hit the university where it cares most in its pocketbook, which is what the, the chancellor seems to have been thinking about when she listened to donors like Stephen N. Miller. You may have wondered, I hope you don't all know about this already, because I'm so proud of my Googling. You, you may have wondered, as I did, who is Stephen N. Miller? I can't see you enough to know whether you're nodding. We know already, but this is what I found in my little Google. He's the donor whose communications with Phyllis Wise are now going to get a great deal more attention than they've already gotten. Aside from inheriting his family's office supply company, and thus coming into a tidy sum to use later as a venture capitalist, he is also on the board of an organization called the Jewish United Fund in Chicago. That sounds innocent enough. 
or it does until you start Googling them. The Jewish United Fund in Chicago are the people who in 2012 fired the entire leadership of the University of Chicago Hillel, thereby eliciting the protests of University of Chicago faculty because they decided that Hillel's leadership had become too independent. And in 2008, according to the Chicago Tribune, the same board closed down an exhibition put on by the city's only Jewish museum on the grounds that, as the board's president said, aspects of it were clearly anti-Israel. The Chicago Tribune called the show, which brought together Israeli artists and Palestinian artists, rewardingly unorthodox. But the Jewish United Fund people are also big donors to the museum, responsible for over 10% of its budget. So they got their way and instantly. The head of the museum said the museum didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But it was clear that some people's feelings could be hurt without the donors or the museum being too bothered by it. And other people's feelings mattered a lot more like the feelings of the money people. Let us call them what they are. They're bullies. Bullies who think that because they have the big bucks by inheritance or speculation or whatever, they also have the power to decide what gets said and seen in the United States. In the university, the situation is very clear. Active involvement by donors and trustees in the running of the university undermines faculty governance shifts authority upwards from the people who have the knowledge to people who have money, from people who make knowledge to people who make money, from people who know how to transmit to the present the knowledge accumulated in the past to people who know how to inherit money, to inherit bank accounts, trust funds, and stock portfolios. This is not just a concern within the university. Rolling back the administration's decision in the Salida case may not be entirely separable from rolling back the Supreme Court's decision on Citizens United. There are various things that I don't entirely agree with Stephen Salida about, but I think I'm actually going to skip them uh, because I have indulged myself and gone on a bit too long. Are we actually likely to see a new McCarthyism, a full-scale repetition of the phenomenon in all of its brutishness? I don't actually think so. What I actually believe is that there's a certain desperation in this arm twisting uh, on the part of Zionism's zealots. They have to know that they're losing the battle for public opinion around the world. Sweden, as you've heard, has just voted to recognize Palestine. In Britain, the House of Commons voted to recognize Palestine by a vote of 274 to 12. It's non-binding, this is true, just symbolic, but what powerful symbolism. And lest anyone not take it seriously, John Cassidy writes in The New Yorker that a statement during the debate made by conservative MP Sir Richard Otway should be a wake-up call. Otway is a military veteran, and he represents an affluent constituency south of London. He voted for the Iraq War and has long been regarded as a staunch ally of Israel. Mr. Otway said, I quote, Israel has slowly been drifting away from world public opinion. The annexation of 950 acres of the West Bank just a few months ago has outraged me more than anything else in my political life, mainly because it makes me look a fool, and that is something that I resent. Here in the US, of course, the politicians keep giving Netanyahu standing ovations, rubber stamping every new theft of Palestinian land, and blaming Hamas for the death of Palestinian children. But even here, there are lots of signs that public opinion is shifting away from the old Zionist pieties. Signs that there are a lot more Jesse Lieberfelds out there applying the equal rights lessons they learned reading about Martin Luther King to the Middle East no longer willing to pretend it's OK to be PEP, progressive except Palestine. According to the polls, young Americans who get their news and got their news about the slaughter in Gaza from social media rather than from newspapers or TV, which are much more highly curated, 
were much less likely to accept the Israeli line. The Open Hillel movement, which had a big conference at Harvard a few weeks ago, has clearly caught on. Their motto is from Rabbi Hillel, if not now, when? The motto is worth stealing. Thank you. I believe I was invited here first and foremost for my involvement in drafting the Jewish letter in support of Stephen Salida, which some of you might have read, or maybe because of my work um, with websites like Jedalia and Mondo Weiss. Um, nonetheless, my experience was very similar to those of the other American Jews in this film. A childhood in a reformed Jewish community and a passive acceptance of all things Israeli as part and parcel to my Jewish identity. And this came, I should add, from the Jewish institutions I was brought up in, not from my family. But nonetheless, the connection I thought I felt to Israel as a young person was very powerful, albeit unexamined. In college, I was confronted with confusing contradictions, then participated in a birthright trip during the 2006 Lebanon War that catapulted me into a serious examination of my long-held ideas about the Middle East. I began to face criticism from my Jewish colleagues and peers. But I had to keep in mind that this difficult experience of political awakening, so to speak, while it was profound for me in many ways, was minor when compared to the kinds of difficulties that Palestinians must face as they struggle to negotiate their places in academic, professional, and other realms. I want to be careful to avoid what Steve Biko, writing on the white liberals in apartheid South Africa, called claiming a monopoly on intelligence and moral judgment and setting the pattern and pace for the realization of, in this case, Palestinian aspirations. So I'm aware that if there is ever to be a just solution in Palestine, it will be first and foremost the result of Palestinian efforts. Palestinian voices, first and foremost, not Jewish ones, really do need to be front and center. But this is one reason why I think this film and the stories within it are so critical. In order to help create more space with Palestinians for Palestinian voices, American Jews need to work diligently at dismantling this notion that any serious critique of Israel is a critique of Jews or Judaism. As a Jew, I am uniquely suited to this role, and it is a role that I am still trying to figure out how best to fill. Bearing this in mind, I have approached with cautious determination questions about Zionism as a movement, about American political support for the state of Israel, and about my role as an American Jew in this discussion. My questions have led me to the most part uh, from, to more questions, but one thing is very clear. This is not about Jews versus Palestinians. Looking at it as such distracts from some very important realities. One important question I've tried to understand is, what historical processes went into and continue to shape the current discourse on Zionism? I've tried to look at what was at stake in this effort to, com to couple Judaism and Zionism, and who stood to gain from such efforts. These questions led me throughout graduate school to research the history and current manifestations of Christian Zionism a movement that actually predates Theodor Herzl, who is widely considered to be the father of uh, Jewish Zionism, by hundreds of years. The relationship of American Christian, the American Christian Zionist movement to Jews and to Palestinians, both Muslims and Christians, can be an odd one. At once intertwined with broader political philosophies of the American right, American exceptionalism, notions of philanthropy, and, I would argue, racist and reductive views of Jews, Palestinians, and the Holy Land. Today, Christians United for Israel is the largest pro-Israel organization in the United States and boasts of strong connections at the highest levels of American politics. I introduce this topic here to illustrate my point that the discussion surrounding Israel and Palestine is not about Jews versus Palestinians. Zionism is not even strictly a Jewish ideology. Yet so many Jews see Israel's relative success over the past 70 years as a result of a Jewish moral righteousness. They see an Israeli David versus the Goliath of the rest of the world. 
So many believe that Israel needs to exist first and foremost to ensure Jewish survival. All of these ideas that we heard expressed in the film just now serve to silence critical Jewish voices and all of, and all of these ideas share the same blind spot. They fail to recognize that so many others out there have something to, at stake in Israel's success that, little, that has little or nothing to do with protecting Jews from another Nazi Holocaust and nothing to do with ensuring human rights for Palestinians and that these people are very powerful. So as Jews, if we choose to throw our hat into the ring when it comes to the conversation on Palestinian rights, we need to be prepared to account for who else is out there claiming to speak in our names. We need to remain firm in our commitment to continually opening up space with Palestinians to speak on their own behalves. And we can do this by chipping away at the tired Zionist tropes that are so often used to silence them. This film, I think, is an important step in that direction. Uh, I hope it serves as a catalyst to action for others who may identify with the experiences recounted within it. For me, watching the film was cathartic, and it has certainly inspired me to work harder to establish a Jewish community here in Champaign-Urbana, where uh, non-Zionist or anti-Zionist uh, views are championed. Um, and I encourage anyone who's interested in being involved in such a community to contact me, by the way. So again, I'll say I'm very flattered to have been invited to speak uh, alongside the others here. And I'd like to just say a personal thank you to Dr. Robbins for his important work. to these lights, I'm sure. Um, about a month ago, Lauren Goodlad contacted me to see if I might be willing to participate tonight as a respondent. She felt that I could, as a member of American Indian Studies, bring a valuable and compelling perspective to the conversation, that my participation might help contextualize the administration's exhortations towards civility at the site where they encounter, embrace, and cajole savagery. A month ago, I said yes. A month ago, I had volumes I still wanted to say into the world and to anyone who would listen about what was happening on this campus, in this community, and especially to my home unit of American Indian Studies in the aftermath of Chancellor Wise's decision to undo the work I had done on behalf of my colleagues in AIS to hire Stephen Salido last year. Over the course of that month, many of us attended faculty senate meetings, raised our voices alongside students and staff, and offered teach-ins on the meaning of academic freedom in the face of the devaluation of certain lives lived and lost at the harsh borders of territory, race, class, gender, religion, and sexuality. 30 days and we have heard from a cacophony of voices, some insightful and others not so much, some passionate and fiery and others fearfully appealing for for ways to bring some sense of normalcy back to what was supposed to be just another dreary work a day in to just another Indian summer. Each of those voices raised, regardless of their pitch and tenor, sought to weigh in on the upper administration and board of trustees' decision to revoke Salida's tenure and summarily dismiss him from this campus before he even set foot on it. A month ago, it still felt like saying something might actually matter in this situation, that being heard, even if, it was, even if from the t tiniest of tin can strung telephone communiques, might cast a line of clarity through the noise and clamor and point a way out of the quagmire. A month ago, it seemed like we still had a chance to shore up the damage, to salvage the reputation of our campus, and to turn that cacophony into a polyphonic chorus demanding justice for a number of of disenfranchised constituencies across this campus, if not across this state, this nation, and this world. Certainly, the logics of speaking up and acting out have deep genealogies within the communities of those of us who, to borrow from Paula Gunn Allen, are like Indians and endure. Breaking silence, giving voice, signifying, making oneself heard and raging against have been vital means to confront hatred, intolerance, abuse, condemnation, and despair delivered by the hands of power in the name of protection, safety, and care. What are the words you do not have yet, Audre Lorde asks us to vocalize. Quote, what do you need to say? What are the ty tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence? Unquote. Your silence, she warns, will not protect you. If you don't have anything nice to say, my mother told me, don't say anything at all. 
At last year's DRIVE workshop, which is the acronym Diversity Realized at Illinois through Visioning Excellence, <laughs> yeah. the Chancellor gathered faculty from across campus and asked us to reflect on why it has been so difficult to recruit and successfully retain faculty and staff from underrepresented minorities. Yeah. American Indians are always the nader in the metrics and we collectively spent the morning contemplating what might be possible reasons faculty from these groups might choose another campus if they have a choice to make at all. In the hallway during one of the breaks and in conversation with an ally from one of the many diversity initiatives this campus sponsors, I was told that the university's mascot history was a non-starter in such discussions and that the, issue of diverse, the issues of diversity on this campus are older than Chief Alinawick. As a Chickasaw, I wondered how that could be possible. This university, after all, is a land-grant institution made possible through the violently coerced dispossession of the Miami, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, Chickasaw, and Sac and Fox peoples who knew, cared for, and learned on these lands and in their own institutions long before settlers arrived. Of course, these issues go beyond dancing, a dancing headdress. But the fact that the chief is now verboten, a conversation killer, an incivil reminder of a community abuse that no one wants to submit happened at all, and that it has, for the most part anyway, and aside from some halftime music and t-shirts stopped, illustrates the deep divide between indigenous scholars and students on this campus and our colleagues. Stephen Salida's hire was part of a capacious vision for our unit as we strove to emphasize the global implications of what that land grant obligation meant to us. His work on the circulation of indigeneity as a concept across Israel, Palestine, and the United States offered, we felt, a necessary intervention to the current prominence of settler colonial studies within the discipline of indigenous studies. In refusing false equivalencies, Salida's work challenged indigeneity's applicability to Israel and Palestine, at the same time that he asked us to consider the epistemic investments the colonizer and colonized both have in making claims to being indigenous to a contested space and to the histories of oppression that might entitle each to that space as reparation. Instead of easy answers, Salida asked us to reflect on the scale and scope of the work we do in the spaces of the dispossessed. Each of us are asked to make our, make our own the tyrannies of sexual harassment, homophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and the daily aggressions, large and small, as a matter of, of course, in the name of making this campus inclusive and in pursuit of those spaces and forms where we might momentarily be heard. And meanwhile, power speaks back to us through the same strategies of refusing to be silent. In the last 30 days, Twitter has seen a rise in misogyny, racism, and hatred, and that's saying something, right? in the name of defending a small but threatened enclave of young, privileged and primarily white men who feel that their culture and identity are under attack by feminists critiquing representations of women in video games. Using death threats, frappinings, and a daily barrage of noise under the hashtags Gamergate and Not Your Shield, these gamers have taken to Twitter to raise their voices against what they feel is a tyranny they have been asked to swallow. The logics of gamer Gamergate are the logics of our campus. In the name of ethics and civility, those with power accuse those drawing attention to structural violences and inequities of being bullies, of ruining something vital, of attacking something precious only power can fully appreciate and truly protect. In the contest of voices, the win has always been to make it seem as if both sides are equally matched in their opposition. There are, after all, two sides to every story. In 30 days, I've gone from shaking with wanting to speak to now not knowing what would be useful to say to validate on the one hand the reality that some on this campus fear Salida's voice and a rising tide of anti-Semitism around the world, and to remember on the other hand that his voice was speaking into a barrage of missiles aimed at a brutalized and entrapped people. In the 50 days between June 8th and August 26th this summer, the state of Israel was able to silence the voices of over 2,200 Palestinians. If we are facing a neoliberal revolution in the form of a new Red Scare, that uses the ethics of speaking as a means to silence, then we are also in a fraught clash over meaning, signification, and interpretation. The answer may not be found in the speaking, but in the spaces of not speaking, of inhalation, of pause. The last two nights have been the annual peak activity for the Orionid meteor showers, and for Southeastern American Indians, of which the Chickasaw are a part, the next 30 days are what's left of this year's cycle for the souls of the dead to prepare for their journey through the door to the afterlife. While everyone knows that this land once belonged to Indians who were, alas, somehow and regrettably removed a long, long time ago, 
I would invite you each to step out into, night air, to, into the night air tonight and really think about what the silence of those who cannot speak means to us now. What words might we have yet to find through which to confront the ongoing implications of that loss on this land and in this community? Thanks. probably redundant to the repeat the oh my goodness uh, of others. Uh, it's almost impossible to read the text in these lights. Um, I'll do my best. Lift it up. Yeah, thank you. I guess you have to do it like this, right, Bruce? Uh, my name's Bruce Levine, and I mentioned that simply to emphasize that I am a Jew. Levine is one of those uh, names, the Jewish version of Smith or Jones, and is basically equivalent to something like Cohen. Um, and my sister tells me that there are very few people who are more Jewish than I in so many ways, from gestures and food ways and so on and so forth. And I grew up in a Jewish family and in a fiercely Zionist family and was a ferocious Zionist until managing to fight my way free of that uh, during the 1973 war. And one of the reasons I was is that I grew up, as it happens, in an anti-Semitic neighborhood. And catcalls and fist fights in elementary school was pretty much the norm for me um, in the first few years of that schooling. So I know what anti-Semitism looks like, and I know what it sounds like, and I therefore know that what Professor Stephen Salaita wrote in his famous tweets was not anti-Semitic. They were, of course, fiercely anti-Israel. That viewpoint doesn't defend me. It doesn't make me uncomfortable. It doesn't intimidate me. And being a Jew does not make me automatically one with Israel any more than it does with the individuals in my friend Bruce Robbins' fine film. On the contrary, at the time of Stephen Salada's tweets, I was saying and writing much the same thing, if to a much smaller audience. So what did he say? That people who can support Israel in the midst of the slaughter that Israel was perpetrating in Gaza are terrible people. That he wished the so-called settlers would disappear from the West Bank. This pronounces the university, is hate speech. It's intrinsically anti-Semitic. And says the chancellor and the board of trustees, there's no place for such words on our campus, no room for people who speak them, even if they speak them, in fact, off campus. It is all, as has been said more than once tonight, based on a deliberate and dishonest conflation of Jews as a people and the state of Israel and its government's policies making criticism of this particular state and its government ipso facto equivalent to denunciation of Jews for being Jews. But no, says our chancellor and our university president and the board of trustees. Barring Stephen Salida from our faculty isn't censorship. This isn't punishing political opinions. It's just the language and the tone that he used that makes him a pariah and that justifies overriding the decisions of a university department and a college dean and the campus provost to hire him. Really, can you imagine someone being punished in this way for expressing virtually the same opinions about, say, Vladimir Putin or Al-Qaeda or Hamas? or for that matter, Cuba, or indeed for denouncing in similar terms nearly any country, government, or movement that is not in public favor in this country? And the answer, I think, self-evidently is no, because it's obviously not strong language and incivility that the university's administrators and non-academic trustees object to. It's the fact that Salida employed that language and tone against a target, a state and government that they like, 
which means in turn that the treatment of Salida and the American Indian Studies Department and the uh, 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 Liberal Arts and Sciences College and whether they know it or not, the treatment of the faculty as a whole on that campus is precisely about political opinions and silencing those that those at the top do not like. And it is a part of a national campaign to silence critics of Israel as Bruce ran down uh, more than adequately. He also explained, I think, why this hysteria is taking place now, uh, why this uh, fierce attack on free opinion on the universities is taking place now, precisely because the Israel right and wrong crowd feel themselves more and more losing support internationally. Beca and that, in turn, is happening because the Israeli government's more openly right-wing, racist, and repressive, and uh, uh, vicious actions are becoming more and more obvious on the world scale, including among, if you pardon the expression, the Jewish diaspora. The Board of Trustees, the Chancellor, and even the heads of the University Senate can understand why, as they often put it, we keep harping on this case. Why can't we let it go? Can't we let the healing process begin. <laughs> no. <laughs> they keep telling us at the faculty senate and elsewhere that there's a long agenda of issues that we need to get to, and those of us who keep talking about the Salida case are preventing us from addressing these other important questions. And what they therefore don't understand is this is the question of the day. This is the important question of the day. This is make it or break it. For anybody concerned for the integrity of this university, for anyone who believes in the right of people to speak their minds, for the right of faculty to hire colleagues who do speak their mind, and for the ability of this university or any other university to serve as a testing ground of the most diverse range of opinions. The Salida case embodies all of that, and its outcome will deeply influence the uh, future of all of those values. So we will not let go of this issue. We will not let some specious healing process begin, not until the Board of Trustees and the Chancellor reverse themselves and rehire Professor Stephen Salida. Thank you. I would ask everyone to come back. Everyone to come back up on stage, <laughs> barring any further audio and <laughs> lighting issues. Um, and as we transition to, I guess, a Q&A and discussion period, um, can we please have a round of applause for Lauren Goodlad who put this together? All of, and also for all of the volunteers in the IMC. I guess we're sitting here. So for those of you who would like to raise a point, have a comment, questions, we're setting up a mic here. Um, um, and if anyone would like to start off by responding to one another, as you could, see, could they can the And can we kill that spot? Yeah, can we, can we uh, turn off the, the spotlight? Is that possible? Is there? start off with the discussion? Yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, 
I want to challenge Harry Nelson to review one of uh, Professor Salida's books. Appreciate all of your, your your work very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All this nice. Um, anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll try and say something to stir up some controversy. Then, one of the things that we noticed in, say, Chancellor Wise's mass mail was rhetoric of civility, don't offend anybody, and uh, it was a neat end run around academic freedom, of course. Uh, but what I want to challenge this group to think about, at least, is the extent to which foreseeably, over the course of many years, the left has somewhat handed those tools to people with the power to use them in the service of power, you know, in the service of people who actually have power that we don't have. And what I'm referring to, of course, is the many decades of somewhat obsessive talk about watching out for each other's feelings and, and being careful not to offend anybody and making sure that it's a welcoming environment. All the rhetoric that then uh, Chancellor Wise was able to use for people who actually have the power in this society, which he does. Uh, and I just want to raise the question of whether anybody looking back thinks maybe that wasn't such a great idea to emphasize that without due respect for the value of that John Dewey saw of putting up with things that hurt your feelings, that you hate, that you wish you think aren't true or wish weren't true, and so on. Thank you. For what it's worth, at Columbia, it's worse. <laughs> I, so I'm grateful to you for making more explicit and bolder something that I really, I kind of knew on some theoretical level, but I only started to feel, since we're speaking about feelings, uh, very strongly when I was writing this. It was exactly as you said it, that we have given them a set of weapons which they are now proving themselves very good at using. And I do think that there was a problem in our use of those weapons initially, um, which you know I'm seeing more clearly now when they're coming back the other way. Um, and you know some of it really it, it sort of comes back to trying to imagine on the left a version of self-assertion for sort of damaged and disadvantaged identities which don't kind of reify those identities and the borders around them. Uh, and yet, 
definitely push the sort of claims in, in, in their name, which is tricky, but it can be done. One of the models that um, I fall back on from time to time is the one that I get from Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau. I don't know if people still read them, but it's, it's a kind of coalition politics in which the idea is in the face of a common enemy, groups which represent otherwise quite very different interests come together in the course of making that coalition in the face of the common enemy, they all have to change. So you never come out of an alliance like that quite as you went in. And the assumption that you must always be open to some degree of self-transformation seems to me the necessary political uh, assumption for this kind of struggle, which is, of course, the struggle of our time. Um, but you know, the, the cruder version of it, which is just saying, I'm injured, is the easier one for people to fall back on. Now, I, I felt a little, um, a little torn to be saying about anti-Semitism something that might have act, that I, I could say as a Jew about anti-Semitism, but some of my friends might not want to say in quite the same way about the various things that they are. But I, it was also, every time I've had an in invitation to speak at this university, I have found myself ask, being asked really interesting questions and saying things that I hadn't thought before. So this is another such occasion for which I'm again very grateful. I have a question to Professor Robin, um, Robbins. Um, it's like I'm asking for an opinion rather than, I don't think it has a specific answer to it, but um, I'm wondering why it is that the case of unhiring Steven Salaita resonating the way it is now um, in this year. Um, why it is that um, Palestine on American campuses now um, considered more controversial than it was in 1948, 1967, 1973, or et cetera, right? Um, and I ask in response to um, this current tendency of treating his case as an anomaly rather than a continuation of um, this tradition, this practice of shutting off Palestinian scholars. Um, and I've been recently approached by people I had previously conversation with about Palestine. They could not, um, where I could not like converse to them about it because um, they seemed not to be interested in the topic or seemed to have conflicting opinions about it, but are now coming to me and saying, we're going to decolonize Palestine. And I'm telling them, well, we've been doing that for 66 years, get on the project, right? <laughs> so I'm just asking, why is it now? Um, that's it, thanks, thank you, thanks. I don't think I have a really good opinion on uh, that very, very interesting question. Um, I, I suppose the first thing that comes to mind is what Bruce Levine said, which is that they're making a very, very big deal about every case now because they're desperate. That is, the, the Zionists feel that they are losing ground in world opinion. Um, and it's a little, it's actually, I understand that this case will not make it seem that way, but um, they're up against more than they used to be. Um, there were easier ways in the past to shut things down or never let, you know, uh, the idea that any Palestinian voice should ever be um, elicited on issues um, for a long time was, would, would simply never come up. You would have, you know, a Jew on this side and a Jew on that side, um, which is to say, the whole conversation was over here and no Palestinians whatsoever. I don't know whether I have to ap apologize. This is for thinking of what Samantha was saying, for having chosen only to have Jewish voices in my film. Uh, but that was a very uh, conscious choice because I thought politically I know the audience that I'm trying to appeal to. Otherwise, I entirely agree with you. Um, I would like to think 
that the desperation partly has to do with a change in the American identification with Israel, which is a kind of you know frontier uh, identification. There's a you know an old frontier story about the people uh, popu populating of this country and the stealing of land from Native Americans, um, which resonated a great deal you know when, with the story of the founding of Israel. Um, uh, a land without people for a people without land, um, and you know, you since you mentioned the early dates in the you know 1948 and the 1950s, I think that and the proximity of the Holocaust gave Israel a kind of free ride in American opinion for a long time, and I don't I think you know the ride is a lot less free these days, and that's a very good thing. I mean that you know there are other. You know, there's a, a kind of fundamentalist Christian support for Israel. There are various, you know, it's not just us who are uh, supporting, uh, I mean, sorry, I don't, of course, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, I think there's probably been a, a, being a big, a, quite a historical change in, in that sense at all, in that sense as well. Uh, I'm not optimistic in the sense that there's simply an accumulation of casualties because my experience in, in talking to people is that they often don't know about the earlier uh, casualties. They know about you know, the, the most recent ones, and then they forget, and they have to be reminded by, which luckily the Israelis will do, uh, by invading again and you know, killing a large number of people again, and therefore the reminder happens. That's right, this, I'm not really as sarcastic as I'm, as I'm sounding. But the, the idea of you can't do what they do, did in 67 and 82 and, and on and on and on and on and the various incursions into Gaza since then without a sense of outrage kind of accumulating. I'm not actually sure that the accumulation is happening. Um, other, I mean, that said, it may be that your, answer, your question is really unanswerable in the sense that it just happened by coincidence here and now, you know, at, in Urbana-Champaign, with this particular case in this particular department, and that it, none of these generalities really is relevant at all. I have a short comment. Of course, um, it's very presumptuous of me to state it, but um, I guess you. Uh, Professor Robbins mentioned this earlier, and I think it's a partial answer to the question that was asked, uh, that it used to be that Israel had a monopoly over the propaganda, so they could control what would get out. But nowadays they have lost it, and I think um, that has contributed a great deal. Like there is electronic intifada, there is Mondovice, and then there are people you know, in Gaza who can actually make videos and send it out. So that's what I think maybe uh, has been a contributing factor. And then, um, because I consider myself more an activist rather than an academic, um, I want to know what should be the next Step. I mean, these gatherings are wonderful in re-energizing re everyone, but along the way, you have to find way, creative ways of keeping the momentum. You, want to, you were mentioning that you're, you're not going to give up, but for how long can we continue the way we are and this uh, exhaustion factor does not set in? And, uh, so that's basically kind of a practical question I have. <clears throat> um, this, this maybe is going to sound a little controversial, but maybe this is a point in the evening where you won't mind a little controversy. I think it would be great if there were, well, uh, more statements on the part of people here at Urbana-Champaign please boycott us. I'm sure there have been such things, but I also imagine that people are quite divided on this because, of course, people stand also to suffer from it. And ironically, it's the progressive people who are likely to suffer most. 
And yet, that of course would give it the extra force if exactly the people who most stood to suffer from it were to sort of step forward and say, in spite of this, please extend the boycott. If you could get people on this campus in the STEM disciplines, you know, to appeal to STEM disciplines elsewhere, that would put the fear of God in your chancellor and your trustees in a way that nobody in the humanities will, will do it, for example. I mean, that's a thing that, that you can do. Um, for those of us who are not on this campus, and if, if you're talking about now the, you know, the, the situation of Palestine in general rather than, than this, well, I personally think the BDS campaign is a good thing. I say this knowing that it's going to be controversial among people who would otherwise agree with each other, uh, in part for the same reason that extending the boycott to people in the STEM disciplines uh, would be a good thing. It will get, you get yourself listened to. People will listen to that in a way that they will not listen to anything else because they're much more threatened by it. I'm not actually a huge fan. Otherwise, academics, I think, by definition, almost by their constitution, are, are not comfortable with the, the boycott idea. But sometimes you have to do things that you're not comfortable with because you think they will move the game along. Uh, and that is what I've come to think. I'm not sure that I would have said the same thing a year or two ago. But now it is exactly what I think. Maybe it's because I'm desperate. Because I cannot stand not to be heard uh, on these issues. I can't resist putting in two cents on what I think we should be doing. Um, I like to think, I hope, given the size of the movement against the firing of Stephen Salida, that we have not yet tapped into the potential base of support that we have on that campus. I don't think we have done an adequate job of bringing our case to the undergraduate students uh, or even the great mass of graduate students or even a substantial number of faculty members. I think what we have done thus far is extremely commendable and valuable, but I like to think, especially in the, on the grounds of academic freedom and the transparent trampling of academic freedom, that there are a large number of people who can be meant to un made to understand how critically important this is almost independently of what they think about an issue about which I feel very strongly, Israel and Palestine. And I think we need somehow to redouble our efforts to get our ideas out of the places where we feel comfortable and out of the circles among whom we feel comfortable and carry that message out into the great mass of people who barely to this day know about this issue, much less the chronology of what happened or the justifications of either side. I, for example, would like to see the next such meeting that takes place of this kind closer to campus, uh, where undergraduates may feel more comfortable attending than they would across the vast dom domain of Champaign-Urbana. Uh, two, quick, two quick things. I wanted to thank you for your film and for coming to speak to us. Uh, I also thought the comments were, were remarkable. All of you hit uh, uh, points that were, quite frankly, um, uh, uplifting and inspirational at this time. I wanted to note in particular the um, um, Samantha, that, that really important um, invoking of Stephen B. Cole and not losing or conflating the critical voice with, in this case, the Palestinian voice. Um, for Jody, it, it's, it's the, the, the challenges of that Native American voice, however it has to be voiced. And, and uh, Stephen, <laughs> this is far from over, and you just really nailed that. But the, the, the two points about the, the centrality of the Palestinian voice uh, in conjunction with an indigenous studies program is absolutely 
key here. I was a bit bothered or surprised to hear you, Bruce, think or sort of uh, um, wonder if this was just a chance kind of thing, but I think it's really key uh, that you had this particular conjunction here. I think, for example, if Stephen was an organic chemist with a $5 million grant, this wouldn't have happened. Even if he said the same things, it wouldn't have happened. So there's something crucial here about, about an indigenous uh, uh, determination in conjunction with the, Palest the Palestinian question. And this leads me to uh, the point that, that, that you came back with, and that's the need for us to really take stock of the, the, the boycott issue amongst ourselves. I see the difficulty around that on campus among, among our allies to be um, the one-two punch with the STEM, with our STEM colleagues as the biggest obstacles we have here. I'm not sure if this is a coalitional politics thing. I, I'm wondering if we need another term or an entirely different paradigm to think about this. The, the, with the STEM folks, um, politics is not there. A and, and we can cite stem cell research and evolution as possible, the next cases to be affected, but in general, our STEM colleagues are not thinking about politics at all. And the, and the boycott issue puts a real strong stop to any progress that we're able to make, uh, beginning with the BDS. I share your, your read, but these are the two things that I think are uh, the two biggest obstacles we have in moving forward. Um, and I'm not sure how to understand them I'm not sure coalitional politics does the trick. Hi there. Um, oh, oh. So um, I think when we talk about Israel Palestine, it does it becomes important to invoke other settler colonial areas like um, we talk about South Africa apartheid a lot, and we talk about as you mentioned and other people have mentioned um, U.S. colonialism and its continuing effects. So in the vein of that, my question is kind of a two-parter. Um, one, as apartheid has fallen and its legacies remain in South Africa, as the U.S. has changed its imperial structures domestically, internationally, what can we as activists who are against these sort of structures, what can we learn from, from how they've changed? And my second question is, what have Zionists learned from this change and how can we combat that in, to some degree? Um, it's <laughs> trying to figure out how to learn from what U.S. colonialism or imperialism knows about itself is, I think, really difficult because it's dependent upon not being able to know itself at all, right? Um, so it's developed an entire system that knows, like I said, that American Indians have um, somehow got treated badly in the past. We all can agree on that, right? But it doesn't actually have any meaning right now to anybody. We can continue to talk about Israel and Palestine. We can and, and battle that here in these spaces that have been made possible through the removal of indigenous peoples here. And so one of the reasons I think Vince was trying to gesture to is that why this is happening now is partly because indigenous studies is making some inroads. We have um, Idle No More in Canada. We have um, people like Naomi Klein linking environmental devastation to the, and, and the future of human survival to indigenous treaties. These are the things that are standing at this moment between us potentially and human destruction. And so the, the, the alliance of this is not, um, an, a, a, not a you know, happenstance. It's that this is the critical moment in which these things will either make change or will 
fall as we tip towards neoliberal control where everything is profit. I mean, not that we're not almost already there, but <laughs> there's glimmers. <laughs> At least that's the hope, right? Is that, and so I'm, the part of me that's optimistic is that this, in some ways, the scale of what's happened to American Indian studies on this campus in the face of, of the undoing and the unhiring and the, un, and the sort of unraveling of our vision and the discrediting of our program on this campus was exactly proportionate to the work that we've done to make our unit strong. Just to add to that point and take it beyond the sphere of the university, I mean, I think, well, A, the uh, creation of an international indigenous movement, which is a relatively recent phenomenon, really from the 80s, uh, is a good example of the kind of, I don't know, maybe coalition is not the right word, but the, uh, a mode of political action which involves a, at least some degree of self-transformation. In the sense, if you think about it, I really shouldn't be saying this maybe in the presence of people who know a great deal, but oddly I've had a chance to watch this since the 80s. Um, different indigenous groups which define themselves extremely locally in, in terms of extreme partic particularity decided that they in, could join together with other groups which also define themselves very locally and in terms of particularity to form an international movement. Everybody had to change in order for that to happen. It didn't leave any particular group exactly what it, as it was. And it has been quite successful as a political movement. Some of you will know, in 2007, the United Nations passed a Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People which, with rights to self-determination and an extraordinary document people had fought for for 25 years. A lot of people thought it was never going to get passed. Now that is a political accomplishment. It's a step in a much longer fight, but it's a very important one. Um, so, you know, it's great that indigenous studies is rising as a movement in the university, but it's not just in the university. And some of the pressure, if this was not a coincidence, may be real political pressure that is being exerted outside the university as well. I don't know about you, but I never expected in my lifetime to see apartheid destroyed. Everything said to me at the time, as hateful a system and as vile a system and as obviously horrifying a system as it was, everything on the surface seemed to say that this was going to last in, indefinitely because they had the guns and they had the money and they had the backing of the United States and arranged against them was a movement that had none of this. And yet it happened, and yet it was overcome. Nobody in 1850 expected to see slavery destroyed within the next generation, but it happened. And I think one of the lessons to be learned from what happened in South Africa, or for that matter, the destruction of an institution like slavery that had lasted millennia, is that even though things seem strong and impossible to overthrow, on the surface, they're not as strong as they seem, and they can be defeated. One of the ways slavery defeated itself was trying to suppress criticism of that institution. By constantly, uh, out of insecurity, clamping down on the free expression of anti-slavery views, the slave owners began to convince a growing number of whites in the United States that the defense of slavery meant an incursion on their rights, was in fact an infringement on their liberties. And this to them was intolerable. I think what we are seeing now, the reaction, the reason that the Salida case and reaction to it has reverberated so widely and so loudly is that it comes in the midst of a large number of attempts to get people fired, to silence organizations, to, uh, 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 to silence, by the way, not only members of national minorities who were critics of Israel. It was, as 
uh, Bruce pointed out not so long ago that as Jewish a guy as you ever saw, Norman Finkelstein in DePaul uh, was denied tenure because he said the wrong things to the wrong people at the wrong, si uh, at the wrong time. But with that case and a series of other cases, a larger number of people are beginning to say, we can't allow this to go on forever. That the Salida case quite clearly is not an isolated case. And people like Bruce elsewhere are, having, are showing the invaluable courage to say as much and to help broadcast the idea that integral to the suppression of the rights of the Palestinians is the silencing of dissent and the incursion on the rights of other people to speak their minds elsewhere. And I think there's reason to believe that that dynamic in which the Israeli government and its supporters find themselves trapped is going to deepen criticism of Israel and a willingness of a growing number of people to look again at what they thought they knew about this question. So, the, oh, excuse me. Um, this is, in some sense, a not terribly informed question, but it arose when it, it came up again for me when the the point was made regarding the role of Christian coalitions for supporting Zionism, and something that just kind of uh, occurred to me while this issue was going on, and again, is by no means isolated uh, to this issue, was, um, the, again, the role of Christian support for, Zion for Zionism and the possibility, if not likelihood, for the deep theological underpinnings for that when thinking about Christian eschatology and the need for, or the expectation for the Jews to convert before the end times, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm by no means a theologian or an expert in any of these areas. But um, it just occurs to me, again, given that, that this point was risen here, the fact that this doesn't seem to have been uh, an issue that's been risen or, um, that's been risen or a connection that's been made, I just wonder, is that just a kind of uh, and not for my sake, but for a broader discussion, a kind of academic reflection that allows one to make a deeper connection, but that is ultimately inconsequential for any kind of political intervention? Or does the role of uh, religion in this issue, and particularly within the US context, particularly thinking of us as a Christian nation, right, which is precisely that of a settler colonial state, and we can see this going back to manifest destiny and things of that sort. Um, I guess I'm just raising, is, is there something to be pursued in this line of thought? Is there something to be uh, made in an intervention by putting to the forefront some of these perhaps in large part also unconscious kind of theological underpinnings that are motivating these uh, political thoughts, uh, excuse me, um, political moves, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to raise that connection. Thank you. If I, if I can just ask, add one thing to the question, which before we answer it, this could be for the rest of the panel to hear thoughts about this, because one of the things that was very clear at least in the way that the media insinuated things about Stephen Salida was that he was in a way one supporter for Hamas, right, code word for Islamic terrorism, um, that he himself must be a Muslim, uh, again, sort of connecting those things, but he himself is an Arab Christian, right? So the, the kind of conflation of, again, this religious question and sort of the pitting of Zionism as the only response for, for Jews Um, I would just say I think that that I agree with I think your question is really important I don't really have the answer to that I'm not an expert on Christian Zionism I just sort of began asking questions about it um, 
in, in graduate school, and I still am very curious to learn more about it. But I think one of the reasons why it hasn't really been a part of the mainstream conversation about Zionism and why the conversation about Israel and Palestine is still formulated as one as Jews against Palestinians or against Arabs is because I think the Christian Zionist, at least in the American political world, the Christian Zionist movement has done a very good job of framing their um, support for Israel and support for the Jews in Israel in particular as a sort of some sort of form of philanthropy, a sort of form of, a, of, of patriotism. So it's not really sold or packaged as a Christian movement, even though they're called Christians United for Israel. When you go to their events or if you read their literature, it reads a lot more like this is the American thing to do. You know, we as Westerners let the Jews die in the Holocaust and we won't let this happen again. And it's our job to protect these people who can't protect themselves against this vicious enemy. Um, and so I think that's, that's part, of, part of the reason is the way that it's framed. Um, but I agree that I think it does need a lot more attention because I think that would, that would change the way that we talk about this and it would change it from Jews versus Palestinians to maybe even a more uh, looking at, at Zionism as, an, as a form of imperialism, which I think it needs to be viewed as.